Welcome to this YSL Excel VBA tutorial. In this video we're going to look at a technique referred to as scraping web pages, which really is a case of using VBA to open up a web page, read its HTML and then get the useful bits of information out of the HTML into a readable format. We're going to start by looking at how to use Internet Explorer to browse to a web page and then we can inspect the HTML of that page using a couple of useful techniques of the browser. We'll mention briefly the document object model, which is the sort of standardized way that web pages are built and show you where you can find out some useful references for how that works. But if we start looking at how to use code to refer to the various HTML elements on the page, which lets us manipulate the page. So we'll do things like fill in text boxes and input boxes on a web page and then identify buttons that we can click on and try to follow hyperlinks. Once we've done all that, we're going to have a really quick look at a simple technique using URL query strings, which involves concatenating the address of the website you want to visit, but passing in various different values to parameters which affects the results the page returns. Not all websites allow you to do that, but we're going to use an example, a really good example of one that does. Rather than using Internet Explorer, um, there's another useful, sort of more efficient technique for getting HTML uh, returned to your VBA code. It's a case of using something called an H XML, HTTP request, and that will become clear when we look at that technique in the video. Essentially, it's a way to avoid having to open up a browser and wait for the page to load. It's a much more efficient, quicker technique. For the final part of the video, we're going to look at the actual scraping part, I suppose. We're going to be looping over various elements of an HTML page, specifically focusing on looping over tables, rows and cells. So we'll have lots of nested for each loops looping through various elements of a, a currency exchange rate website. We'll wrap up the video by looking at a quick simple user interface using a basic user form, which gives a drop down list for us to select a currency, enter an amount and then return a set of exchange rate tables to various different worksheets. So it's quite a long detailed video, hope you're up for this one. Let's get started. We'll start the video by looking at how to get Internet Explorer just to browse to a simple website. So I'm beginning with a brand new blank Excel workbook. The only thing I've done so far is saved it as a macro enabled workbook. So from there I can head into the developer tab of the ribbon, choose Visual Basic, and we'll start a brand new module just to get this to work. The first subroutine we're going to create in here, I'm going to call something like uh, Browse to Site. If we want to control Internet Explorer, we'll need some kind of variable which can hold a reference to the application. This is a lot like the technique we used to control Microsoft Word or PowerPoint in previous videos. And you might remember from those videos on Word and PowerPoint etc that there were two different ways you could control an application. You can use a technique called early binding or a technique called late binding. Just to very quickly cover the, the difference between those two techniques. If I was using late binding, all I would need to do is start by declaring a variable which can hold a reference to any generic object. So the type of the variable will be object. What we can then do is set that variable to refer to the result of the create object function in VBA. So we can say create object and then open some parentheses and then I need to state the name of the class of object that I'm trying to create. So in this case what I'm trying to do is create something that refers to an internet explorer, which I can just about spell, dot application. What I can then do is control that application by using IE dot, but sadly I don't see any IntelliSense, I don't get any help here whatsoever, because technically speaking the IE variable could contain any object. So you have to know what properties and methods the application has. So just to show you a couple of very, very basic ones just to get started, I know that I can make the Internet Explorer application visible, so I can change its visible property to true, and I can also make it navigate to a page. So I'm going to say navigate and then pass in a simple URL. So let's go for, well, let's go for Wiseal to begin with. So www.wiseal.co.uk. Just in case you've forgotten, I think I mentioned that in every single video. OK, so having just done that, I can execute the, uh, the code just by pressing F5, and we ought to see a simple Internet Explorer window popping up, browsed to the WiseAL homepage. Now, although late binding works, it's not necessarily the best technique when you're first learning how to use an application. So let's just close down that instance of Internet Explorer, and then let's show you how you can use early binding instead. So early binding requires you to set a reference to an object library. So in this case what we're going to have to do is head to the tools menu and then choose references. 
And the particular library that we're looking for in here is called Microsoft Internet Controls. It's quite a long list of libraries. You may, remember, as I say, remember this from previous videos in the series. So let's just find out. Come past it. There it is, Microsoft Internet Controls. Very important that we check the box next to that library. So then I can click OK. And what I can do now is rather than referring to um, the Internet Explorer as an object, I can reference it as a specific class. Now if you'd like to see which new classes and methods and properties you have access to having referenced this library, the simplest thing to do is head into the object browser. So you can either do that from the view menu and choose object browser, or indeed just press the F2 key on your keyboard. Using the drop down list at the top of that window, you can select the new library that you've just set a reference to. Now its name isn't that obvious in this list, it's actually called shdocvw, I'm not quite sure what that abbreviation is for, but anyway, if I choose shdocvw, this gives me a list of all of the classes that are available to me from that library. And the one we're really interested in here is the one called Internet Explorer. So if I select that, we can see it's got a list of methods and properties, and this will all help us with the IntelliSense when we come to start writing code. Let's just close down the object browser and see how we can manipulate the code now to use this new class. The first thing we can do is replace the word object in the variable declaration with a reference to the specific class that we want, which in this case is Internet Explorer. So if I press Control and Space, you'll see that if I look for Internet Explorer, it now appears in the list along with all the other classes. Sometimes it's useful to, uh, to precede the name of the class with the name of the library that it belongs to. This is particularly important when you've got duplicate classes defined in, in multiple libraries that you've referenced. So the name of the, the, uh, the library is called shdocvw, as we've just seen. Then if I enter a full stop there, that limits the classes presented to me to just those defined in that library. So I can say shdocvw.internetexplorer. What I can then do is modify the set statement. So rather than using the create object function, what I can do instead is say set IE equal to a new instance of an sh.vw dot Internet Explorer. If I could spell dot vw Internet Explorer, there we go. So that essentially reproduces the same functionality that we saw in the previous example. One massive advantage of this is that when I say IE a dot on another line, I don't just get oh, I don't just have to guess what the methods and properties are anymore. I get a lovely IntelliSense list showing me all the methods and properties. So I'll find the visible property in there, somewhere down towards the bottom of course, there it is, and I'll find the navigate method as well. So the two things that we've just done. I also have another opportunity to save a little bit of time and space with my code here as well. So rather than having to set a new instance or create a new instance of the application in a separate statement like this, I can actually combine this functionality in the variable declaration. So if I say dim IE as new shdocview Internet Explorer, I don't technically now need to explicitly create a new instance of it at any point. This is referred to as an auto-instancing variable, so it doesn't actually create the new Internet Explorer in this declaration. What it does is it waits until the variable name is used in code, and then it checks to see if that variable references something yet. If it doesn't, it automatically creates a new instance as and when it's required. So you can save a little bit of time and effort when you're using this, uh, this early binding technique. Anyway, having done all that, and hopefully you're happy with the difference between early binding and late binding, just to prove that it all works in just the same way, the end result will be the same. If I run the subroutine, I'll end up back on the WiseL homepage. Now, although we're not going to use Internet Explorer for the entire video, it is worthwhile just seeing a few of the basic things you can make it do. So I'm going to close down this instance of Internet Explorer. If we want to manipulate a web page once it's loaded, it's really important that we wait until Internet Explorer has navigated to the page. So whatever code I write after the IE navigate would ordinarily try to take place immediately, and that might have happened before the page is finally loaded. Just to demonstrate that, I'm going to write a quick little debug.print statement. So I'm going to say debug.print, and we're going to say IE dot uh, location name, sorry, IE rather than IT, beg pardon, IE dot location name, followed by a comma, and then IE dot location URL. We're going to try to print out two bits of information about the page we've just navigated to. I'll need to display the immediate window, which I can do from view, immediate window, we'll just press Control and G, and then if I were to execute the code, what we should see is at the bottom of the screen, in the immediate window, we ought to see the values that I've requested, but you can clearly see that it hasn't printed anything. If I close down Internet Explorer, nothing has appeared there at all. 
So to make Internet Explorer wait until the page has finished loading, we're going to add a couple of lines of code in between navigating to the page and then trying to do something with it. So a common approach to doing this is using either a do until or a do while loop. I'm going to use a do while loop. What we're going to do here is test the ready state of the Internet Explorer application. So I can say do while ie dot ready state is not equal to, then there's five different states that Internet Explorer can be in. I'm going to choose the one that says ready state complete. So I'm going to carry on looping round until, or sorry, beg your pardon, while, the, uh, the ready state is not complete. Now you can write some lines of code inside this loop, but it's not actually necessary. Common things you'll see are things like application dot wait, so you can make it wait until a particular time of day. The common approach is to say now plus a time value of one, uh, so one second, so that would add one second to the time right now. Another thing you could do is use do events to what well, the literature says is that it yields the uh, the control to the system to make the system do anything that it needs to do. But you don't technically need to do any of those things. It's perfectly sufficient just to uh, just have the loop going round, testing that condition. Once that has been met, then the code will continue. So, having done that, all I'm going to do now is run the application again, run the submission again, and we'll see this time that we do actually print out some information about the web page. Okay, now that we've got a web page successfully loaded, let's look at a couple of the very basic things we can make Internet Explorer do to it. Just to demonstrate this technique, I'm going to change the website that we're browsing to. I'm going to use Wikipedia as just a simple little example. So I've actually already browsed to Wikipedia using Google Chrome, so I'm just going to head back there. I'm going to copy the, the URL from the address bar. So I select the entire URL and copy that. Just in case you were wondering why I'm not using Chrome, I'm using Internet Explorer for this demonstration. It's simply because Chrome and Firefox and other browsers don't provide a VBA object library to use. There are some third-party tools you can use to make Chrome and Firefox, etc. work, but I've never used them myself, so Internet Explorer is reasonably reliable. But we're not going to be using Internet Explorer for the rest of this, for most of the rest of this video. Um, we'll, uh, we'll show you another technique that means you can avoid using web browsers altogether, but we'll get onto that a little bit later on. Anyway, having copied the URL for Wikipedia, I'm going to paste that in, in place of WiseOwl. And just to quickly mention, because we're using Internet Explorer here, it doesn't really matter if you haven't got fully formed URLs. So when you type in um, websites in the address bar in Internet Explorer or your web browser, you don't tend to find yourself writing HTTP, etc. So because in, we're using Internet Explorer, there's validation in place that will add all the necessary prefixes. So you don't really need to write fully formed URLs. OK, let's just test that, that one works by running the subroutine. And having done that, you can see down at the bottom we printed out some information about Wikipedia. Now the reason I'm using Wikipedia is because it provides us with a nice little opportunity to manipulate the page using VBA code. What we're going to do is get our VBA to write a search phrase in the search box and then click the Go button to search for whatever we've typed in. Now that does require knowing at least a little bit about the structure of the page. Fortunately, every web browser lets you see the HTML code that makes up the page simply by right-clicking in its background somewhere and then choosing the option similar to View Source. It might be named slightly differently in different browsers. So if I choose View Source in Internet Explorer, it gives me a, uh, an item or a section at the bottom of the page showing me all the, the HTML code. Same sort of thing in Chrome, just to, just to make sure you're happy with this. If I right-click in the background of the Chrome page and then say View Page Source in this case, I'll get a slightly different way. Uh, so it actually takes me to a separate page altogether, a separate tab in Chrome. Now, picking through all the code in here is a little bit tricky to do. So rather than try to work out exactly where the, uh, the code for the, this particular search box is located, what we can also do, if I switch back to Internet Explorer, what I can also do is actually right-click on a single specific item in the page and choose to Inspect Element. So what that will do, in this case again in Internet Explorer, it takes me to the exact same panel at the bottom of the page, and it takes me to this DOM Explorer. So DOM is short for document object model, which is a standardized way of, of building pages or, or referring to the items in a page. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to make Wikipedia search for the document object model. Now the important thing about having inspected this element is it takes us to the exact place in code where that element is defined. So you can see that for this input box, this text box, it's got a tag here called input, so that's the type of object that it is, and it's got a specific name attribute called search. That's also part of a form 
So this form is another tag which has an ID of search form. So what we're going to do is write some code to change the value property of the search element of the search form form in the entire document. So let's just close down, or in fact, let's just switch back to um, in, uh, to our VB editor, and we'll add a little bit of code in after we've printed out the location and URL of the page. To start with, of course, we'll need to reference the Internet Explorer application, and then inside there, we're going to refer to the document property. Now, the document property simply refers to the HTML document that builds up the web page. Now, sadly, at this point, the IntelliSense breaks down a little bit. If I type in a full stop, I don't get any further help whatsoever. We're going to see a much more sophisticated way to inspect the HTML of a web page. We're, we're going to use the document object model um, to, to sort of really get into the detail of a page later on in the video. But for now, just as this first simple example, you can kind of treat items on the page as though they were VBA collections. So imagine there was a collection of form objects, which we could legitimately refer to as forms. Inside there, we could refer to a form by name, and I've just found out that the name of that form was search form. That's what we saw in the uh, inspect element um, option in Internet Explorer. So within there, a form has got a bunch of sub-elements, so we've got an elements collection inside the form, and one of those was simply called search. So that was the name of the input box that we could type our search phrase into. Inside there, we've got a property called value, and again, without knowing the in without having the IntelliSense, you just kind of have to trust that this is the case. Um, and then we can make that equal to, and then in some double quotes, let's search for document object model. Okay, so what that should do is fill in the value of that search box on the Wikipedia page. I'm just going to close down the currently open Wikipedia page. So I'm going to close down the instance of of Internet Explorer, and then I'm going to execute the code just to see if this works. So there we go, we've got the page opened up, and it's now got document object model typed into that search box at the top. The next thing to do is work out how to click that button. So again, if I right click on that button and I choose inspect element, what we should see is it takes us to the exact part of the code that defines what that item is. So it's another part of the same form. So you can see it's a um, form ID search form, but within that, Form, we've got another nested element whose name is Go. So, knowing that, if I just close down this um, this in instance of Internet Explorer, I'm just going to essentially copy and paste most of this line here. So I'm going to copy all of that line that refers to the individual items. Uh, maybe a width block would be a sensible thing to use here. But I'm not interested in the search element this time, I'm interested in the Go element. And what I'm going to do in this case is rather than try to change its value, I'm going to apply a method to it. So I know that I can apply a click method to certain objects on the page. Okay, so having done that at this point, I'm going to run this one one more time, and then we should see that Wikipedia opens up, it types a search phrase into the box, and then clicks the Go button to browse to it. It is probably worthwhile having a bit of a read of this page at some point. I'm not suggesting right now, I'm not going to go through everything that's on here, but it gives you a nice bit of background information about the techniques we're going to use going forwards in this video. And there are lots of nice links as well to other pages that'll give you more detailed breakdowns of how uh, the document object model works. So feel free to have a look at the references at the bottom of the page and the external links. Have a quick read of those at some point, maybe in your spare time. Okay, so at this point I'm just going to close down that instance of Internet Explorer and we're going to go a little bit further and see how we can actually get references to the document itself rather than having to rely on predicting what the individual names of the items on the page are. So before we do this, let's have a separate example. I'm just going to copy and paste essentially the entire subroutine that I've already got, and then I'm going to paste it in into, let's say, a new module just to keep things nice and neat and tidy. So I'm going to insert a new module, and then I'll paste that subroutine in. I'm going to change the name of the subroutine this time uh, to something like uh, get HTML document. And then we'll change a few little things here as well. I'm going to clean up the immediate window first of all. So I'm going to click in there, press Control A, and then delete to get rid of it. We'll use the immediate window again shortly. And then I'm going to get rid of a few unnecessary bits of this code. So I don't need to see the uh, the, the explicit set, i.e. to a new instance. We've already got that, an auto instancing variable. We don't need the debug.print statement here. And we don't need the uh, the bit about the about changing the uh, the values of various elements on the page. So I'm going to get rid of those lines as well. 
what I want to do next is get a reference to the um, the the web page that we're browsing to as an actual HTML document rather than the basic document property of Internet Explorer. Now just to make sure that we get as much help as possible with this we're going to set a reference to another object library. So let's head up to the tools menu and choose references again and then if we scroll down far enough what we're looking for this time is something called Microsoft HTML object library. So let's make sure we don't go past it. There it is, Microsoft HTML object library. Make sure you check the box next to that and then click OK. If you want to get an idea as to how much or how many classes are defined in this library, have a quick look in the view menu and choose object browser again. And then change the drop down list at the top to read MS HTML. That's the name of the library we've just referenced. There's a huge number of different classes listed in this library. It's a pretty sophisticated tool. We're, of course, not going to go through every single last item in here in this video. That would last forever. We're going to go through enough of these just to give you a starting point for manipulating HTML documents. Let's just close down the object browser and let's write a little bit of new code now to get a reference to the HTML document. What we'll do first is declare a variable which can hold the HTML document we're going to retrieve. So let's say something like dim HTML doc as ms HTML dot HTML document. Okay, having done that, what we can do is once the web page is loaded and Internet Explorer is ready, we can say set HTML doc equals IE dot document. So that stores a reference to the document in that new variable. Now this is useful because it gives us much finer control over the items in that HTML document. Just to get a bit of a clue, I say HTML doc dot, you get an idea of how many methods and properties we've got access to in here. So we can get references to items in the page. There's a whole bunch of methods to do with getting things, getting elements, which we'll look at fairly shortly, and all sorts of other useful methods and properties that we're going to work with in other parts of this video. So just to demonstrate why this is potentially useful, I'm going to get rid of that little line there. And again, I'm going to change the web page that we'll browse to. So I'm going to go back to the WiseAL web page, in fact. So let's change the URL back to wiseal.co.uk. Notice here I'm missing out the www part. As we said, the um, Internet Explorer handles the missing parts of a URL. So having done that, I'm going to run the subroutine to browse to WiseAL. And what I'd like to do is a similar thing to what we did with Wikipedia. I want to be able to type something into this search box and then click the go button. But we've got a little bit of an issue with this. If I right click on that search box and choose inspect element, what we'll see this time is that the input in here, although it has a name, it's called what, it's, it's part of a form which doesn't have a name. So I haven't got any easy, convenient way to refer to the element of this page like I did with Wikipedia. I can't say forms, form name, dot elements, element name. So what we're going to do instead is use some of the HTML libraries techniques for referencing that specific object by its ID or by its name. Let me just close down that instance of Internet Explorer and then we'll write a little bit of code to get a reference to it. Let's declare a variable that's going to hold a reference to that search box. So I'm going to declare a new variable at the top, which I'm going to call, uh, let's call it HTML input. Spell HTML correctly, first of all, HTML input. And I'll declare this as an MSHTML dot IHTML element. So an IHTML element uh, allows us to hold a reference to any individual item on an entire web page in an entire HTML document. Having done that, I'm going to set my HTML input down at the bottom, set HTML input equal to HTML doc dot. And then what I'm going to do is use one of its methods to get an item by its ID. So there's a method in here called get element by ID or by name. So if I say get element by ID and then open some parentheses and then open some double quotes, as we've just seen, the name of that element on the web page or in the, in the web page's source when we inspected the element was called what. So if I double close the double quotes and then close the parentheses, what I can now do is change the value of that object. So I can say HTML input dot value equals, I don't know, let's search for let's search for XLVBA as that's what we're that's what we're dealing with. 
OK, so having done all of that, let's run the subroutine just by pressing F5. And we should see that we've now typed in Excel VBA into that search box. Now the next thing I want to be able to do is click on the Go button. But we've got another problem with this as well. If I right click on the Go button and choose to inspect the element, we'll see that when the code does finally pop up in the Document Object Model Explorer, then we'll see that although it definitely is a button, you can see there, the class, or sorry, the, um, the tag is a button, it doesn't actually have a name or ID attribute. So that gives us a little bit of an issue. What we're going to do, because we can't reference it by ID, as it doesn't have one, we're going to reference it by its tag. So the first thing we're going to do is try to return a collection of all of the buttons on the page and then loop through those buttons to see which ones belong to the collection and see if we can identify this specific one. So there are a few few unique bits of information about this button. So for instance, it's class name, uh, type and value. So maybe we can use those instead. So having done, having established that we want to do that, let's close down this instance of Internet Explorer. The first thing we need to do is declare a variable which can hold multiple HTML elements. So I'm going to call this one dim HTML, let's call it buttons, as an MSHTML dot IHTML element collection. So rather than type all that in, let's just scroll through the list. So an, an element collection can hold, of course, multiple items. So having done that, let's scroll down a bit further and we can say, let me just tidy up my code a little bit just to give myself a little bit more space. What I'm going to say next is set HTML buttons equals HTML doc dot get elements by tag name. So tags are things like buttons and divs and etc etc. We'll get our tag names by a button and that will give us a reference to all the buttons on the page. What we now need to do is establish which buttons belong to the collection to see if we can identify the one we want. So to do that, I'm going to declare another variable up at the top of the page, of course, and which is going to be dim HTML button. So just a single button this time. So that's going to be an MSHTML dot, sorry, MSHTML, that was meant to be, dot IHTML element. So just a single one. And then just like any other collection of objects in VBA, you can loop over those using a for each loop. So I'm going to say for each HTML button in HTML buttons. Close off the loop by saying next HTML button. And then inside there, let's debug print some useful information about the items in it. So I'm going to say, let's say debug.print. Let's say things like HTML button dot class name, so that was one of the attributes of the button. We could also say HTML dot, what else could we print out? Let's say tag name, just to prove that we are printing out information about buttons. We can say, uh, sorry, HTML button dot tag name. So that should only, of course, be button, because that's the type of objects where we've got access to. Um, we could try to print out the ID of the object, but we know that it doesn't have one. So we can say HTML button dot ID, but we know that that doesn't exist. Another potentially useful thing we could do is say HTML button dot inner text. So the inner text, I'll show you what that is in just a moment, but if I say inner text, and then let's just have a look at what that prints out. So if I run the code, we'll see Internet Explorer pops up and we get a list of all of the buttons on the page. Now the immediate window shows us that there's only information about a single button that's been printed. So if I just go back to the web browser and right click on the button that we were trying to get access to and inspect the element, when the code opens up you can see that there it is. So it's class name that we printed out is search underscore underscore submit. And then the uh, the class, oh sorry, the tag name must have been button because that's what we've asked for. The ID part is empty. We know that it doesn't have an ID or a name attribute. And the inner text part has been printed out as well. It says go. So the inner text part is, if you can see here, inside the start tag and the end tag of the HTML button, you can see they've got the text there, go. So that indicates what's displayed on the button. 
Now you might be looking at that and thinking, well, why is it only printed information about one single button when it looks like there's lots and lots of buttons on the page? These things all look like buttons, clearly. Um, it's kind of impossible to tell just by looking at a web page without inspecting the source what that actual item is. So although it looks like a button, if I right click and choose inspect element, you'll see that it's actually not a button tag at all. You can see that what's been highlighted is an A tag. Now A tags refer to hyperlinks, basically. So essentially all this is is just some fancy formatted hyperlink text sitting on the page. It's not a button after all. It has got a class name, um, button alpha. Um, who knows why it's called button alpha? I didn't design the website. But um, so the class name indicates that it's it's meant to be a type of button, but its actual tag name definitely isn't. So that actually makes our life a lot easier. If we know that there's only a single item in the buttons collection here, we can reference it by index number. So all collections in VBA, of course, are indexed. And it just so happens that the indexes for HTML element collections begin at zero. So if I know that I've only got one item in that collection, I can say HTML buttons, open some parentheses, the index of this will be zero, then I can apply the click method to it. OK, I can comment out the for each loop as well. I don't need to do that now that I've established how many buttons I've got. So all I should need to do now is execute the code again. And I'll end up with XLVBA typed in. And then I've clicked the button to see the search results for XLVBA. OK, so that one was fairly easy because we found out that there was only one button on the page. So we could just reference it by its index number. What if there was a slightly more complicated page? So I've actually browsed one already. I'm just going to close down Internet Explorer for the moment. And then let's head back to Chrome. And I've got a page up here, one that I used in a previous video, actually, when we were using query tables to get tables of exchange rates. So what we've got here is a slightly more complex site with a bunch more different things we can click on. What I'd like to do is be able to connect to this site and then fill in some various values in these inputs and then click the correct link or button, whatever it turns out to be, to go to that specific page. So ideally what I want to be able to do is go to the rates table page so we've got some data to pick out. So back to the VB editor and again just to tidy up a little bit I'm going to clear out the immediate window first by Control A and then delete and then I'm going to make another copy of this entire subroutine and then stick it into a new module. So let's say have a new module and then paste all that in and I'm going to Use, I'll change the name of this subroutine so that it's called something like uh, Browse to Exchange Rates. So let's just change the code a little bit. We, uh, we don't want to browse to the YSL page this time, of course. We want to browse to a site called x-rates.com. So I can just type that directly in, xrates.com. And I don't know what um, what elements are on that page yet, so let's just get rid of all this code here about clicking buttons and getting elements by ID. We may well do something very similar in a moment. We definitely want to get a reference to the HTML document though, so we'll leave that one in there. And um, we're probably going to have inputs to type into, so I'm going to leave that variable in there. Um, and let's just leave the buttons in there for the time being as well. At this point, let's just make sure that that part works. We can browse to the page and see what's in there in Internet Explorer. OK, so let's see what inputs we're working with first of all. I'm going to right click on the input that lets me type in the amount I'm trying to convert and choose inspect element. And once the DOM Explorer has got to the correct part, we can see that it's actually got a name. It's got a name and an ID, both called amount. So that's good news. It means we can reference that, that item directly by getting element by ID. Let's do the same thing for the currency we're converting from. I can right click and choose inspect element. And that one tells me it hasn't got a name, it doesn't look like. Oh, but it has got an ID, so that one says from. So we can use, again, get element by ID. If we were going to change the, uh, the currency we're converting to as well, then we could find out what that one is and choose right click and choose inspect element. And we'll find that that one is called, uh, it's got an ID of two. So that's good news. It means we've got unique names for all these things. We've got amount, from, and to. So let's deal with filling in those things first of all. Let's close down Internet Explorer and work out how we get references to each of those inputs. So we'll use the variable we've already declared up here, HTML input. So let's say set HTML input equals HTML doc dot get element by ID. And then we know that its name was called amount, so that's a nice simple one to get.
We can then say HTML input dot value equals, and then let's just prove that it will change. Uh, let's say it's something slightly different. Let's say I don't know. Let's say five, for example. Then effectively, we can just repeat that for the other two inputs in case we wanted to change them. So let's copy and paste those two lines of code, and I'm going to change the next one so that it's uh, next ID is from. So that's the currency we're converting from. Now we have to be slightly careful about this because on the website itself is a set of drop-down lists. Um, so choosing from the drop-down lists means we, we we have to be slightly careful about what values we put in. So the currencies we're allowed to use are three-letter codes for the currencies. So I think it was in US dollars to begin with. Let's put it into GBP instead. Okay, and then the next thing, just to prove that it will work, we may well not end up using this one, but if I just copy those two lines again and paste it in again, excuse me, sorry, missed that, copy that and then paste it in again, and then change the input or the ID to the two element, and then in this case we'll change it from GBP to, let's say, let's say, uh, I don't know, USD, let's go to US dollars. Okay, just to see if all that works, let's just hit F5 to execute the code and make sure that when everything's finished and the page is finally loaded, we've got all the inputs changed to the values we've asked for. So we've got 5, GBP, and USD. Okay, the next thing we have to do is work out how to click the appropriate button. What I'd like to be able to do is see the rates tables for the particular inputs. So to make that work, I'm going to right click on that item and I'm going to choose to inspect the element. When the document object model finally loads and points me to the right place, what we can see here is that it's not a button, just like we saw on the YSL page, it's not a button, it's an A tag, it's just a basic hyperlink. Now it's likely there are going to be lots and lots of links on the same page, lots and lots of A tags. So we're going to have to do a little bit more work here. Let's see what we can investigate. So we can loop over all the hyperlink tags, or all the A tags first of all. And we've got a couple of attributes. We've got on click, which tells us the, well basically what code is triggered when somebody clicks on it. And we've got an href, which is the actual URL that it'll browse to. And L, uh, sorry, rel. Uh, relative so it's um it's got a, a relative attribute of rates table so let's see um let's first of all let's deal with looping over all the hyperlink tags all the a tags first of all i'm just going to close down that instance of internet explorer and then let's just change some of our variables we've got html buttons and button let's call this html um a's and HTML A. So we'll, we'll use the tag names, which makes it look a little bit silly, but there we go, HTML A's and HTML A. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is get a reference to the collection of A tags. So after we've filled in the various inputs, let's have a look. Let's say set HTML A's equals HTML doc dot get elements, excuse me, get elements by tag name. So in this case the tag name is nice and easy, the tag name is just A. And again having done that we can write a simple for each loop. So we can say for each HTML A in HTML A's. Hit next and, oh, sorry, hit next HTML A, big pardon. And then what I want to be able to do is print out some useful information. So let's say debug.print and let's say, oh, I don't know, what we'll do here actually, we're interested in the attributes of the, of the A tags. Those are the things that give us the most useful information. So what we're going to do is say HTML A dot, and there's a method here called get attribute. So the attributes, as we saw, the little names that were in red text inside the tags. So we could do things like print out the class name. Class name is one of the attributes. So we could say class name. We could also say, uh, HTML a dot get attribute. Um, the two that we were re really interested in were href. That was the name of the uh, the link that it points to, or the the HTML. Sorry, beg your pardon. The URL that it was pointing to, and the other one was HTML a dot get attribute. Open some parentheses and quotes, and the other one was called rel. Okay, so having done all of that, let's find out what happens if we execute the code and see how many items we get printed out. Eventually, it will pop up. So there's quite a few in this case. I'm just going to close down the uh, the web page at that point, 
and have a quick look at what we've got. So all the hyperlinks, you can imagine that page is full of all sorts of hyperlinks. So lots and lots and lots of rows here. Hopefully if we scroll up far enough to the, towards the top, it's kind of a, a good clue here, I think, that these are the, the, the very top menu bar in the page. So those are the links in the top menu bar. Scrolling down a little bit further, we've got an amount field arrow. Um, we've got some things there. Now these are looking a little bit more familiar. So it looks like m many of these a tags don't actually have a class name. Some of them do, but some of them don't. The um, the href and the rel, it looks like most of them have got an href and a rel. Certainly everything's got an href. So we can see that we've got this href to xrates.com table and rates table, which is this rel attribute. That gives us a clue about how we can actually get access to that individual specific hyperlink. So although we're not going to be able to reference it by ID or by name, we do ha at least have some kind of information that can give us access to it. One last little quick thing I forgot to mention, just in case you wanted to find out how many items there were in a particular collection. I'm going to add a quick little debug.print actually to the end of my loop that's going to say debug.print HTML A's dot length. So if you want to know how many items there are, if I just run this one again, we'll see that we get the same list of things spit out. But eventually at the bottom it will point out, it will print out how many items there were. So 102 different hyperlinks. Okay, so having established all that, let's work out how we can get or drill into this specific one that we're interested in. Okay, so let's just tidy up a tiny little bit here. I'm going to get rid of that last debug.print statement I've just added. And then what I'm going to do is write a couple of lines of extra code inside the for each loop. So we'll still we'll still loop over all of the attributes, sorry, all of the A tags. But for each one, we're going to check if its href and rel attributes match the link we're trying to click on. So essentially, we're just going to write a basic if statement. So I'm going to start by saying if. And then the first thing I'll check is if the href attribute, which I'll just copy that, and then paste it in. And I want to check if that is equal to, and then if I scroll up in my immediate window, I ought to be able to find the one that I was looking for. So rather than having to type it all out and risk getting it wrong, this is the one that I was after. So when the href is equal to xrates.com forward slash table. So I copy that out and paste it inside a set of double quotes. Now just to make absolutely sure, I'm gonna check the rel attribute as well. So I'm gonna say and, and then I'm going to copy and paste this part. And when the rel attribute is equal to, and then once again, to avoid mistyping it, I'm going to copy and paste rates table. So in some double quotes, paste that in, and then at the end of that, say then. OK, so that's quite a long-winded line of code. Let me just see if I can change the width of my screen a little bit so you can see a little more clearly what's happening. There we go, so there's a full if statement. Let's wrap that up with uh, an end if. And then inside there, what I basically want to do is, if that is the correct link that I'm looking for, then I want to click it. So I can say HTML A dot click. Just like we did for the button in the YSL website example. Last of all, I don't want to then continue looping through all of the other tags, all of the other A tags. So at that point, I'm going to say exit for. Now hopefully having done all of that, if I just comment out maybe the debug.print statement to avoid printing it all out again, let's have one last go at running this just to check that it works. So I hit F5 to run it and we'll see that all the values get filled in and it has indeed followed the link to get to the next page. You can see that it's actually blanked out the from, oh, sorry, big from the to um, inputs. That wasn't actually important. When you view the rates tables, it shows you lots and lots of different currencies on the same page. So it, we can probably just get rid of this, or in fact, we can of course get rid of that input where we're changing the two. So at that point, let's close down Internet Explorer and let's see what we can do next. Okay, so we've seen a little bit about how we can get Internet Explorer to control the web page you've browsed to. But in many cases, you'll probably find that you don't actually have to go to this amount of trouble. This particular site we browse to here, the xrates.com, has a really nice convenient way for us to get a particular list of currencies.
currency exchange rate for a particular currency in a particular amount. If I just run this code again just so that we can browse to that page, we saw this technique actually used in the previous video when we were using query tables. If you can have a look at the address bar here and look at the URL, you'll see that it's got a question mark in it indicating the start of a query string. So after the question mark, there's a couple of named parameters. There's a from parameter, which is equal to GBP, and an amount parameter equal to the number five. Now, because a URL in terms of VBA, manipulating it in VBA, is just a string, you can concatenate that string out of its various component parts. So rather than having to browse to the home page and then work out how to fill in the form and click on the button, we could have actually just navigated to that specific page in the first place. So let's have a quick go at doing that. I'm going to copy this entire subroutine again at this point just for the sake of convenience, copy that to the clipboard and then insert a new module and then paste it all in and then let's rename it so we can say uh, browse to exchange, exchange rates with query string. Now we can actually get rid of a lot of the code in this particular subroutine so let's scroll down a little bit and we can get rid of all the uh, parts where we set a reference to the various inputs and then change their values. Likewise for getting a reference to all the A tags and then looping over them we don't need any of that at all. Let's just get rid of all of that and then we can modify the URL so xrates.com forward slash table forward slash and then that's the start of the query string so we enter a, a question mark. The two parameters there were from and we can make that equal to let's say let's say GBP followed by a an ampersand which will allow us to add on another parameter and we can make the amount parameter equal to uh, let's just do something slightly different just so you can see it is different let's say three and that will essentially achieve the same result as what we did with a much more complex example previously so that means we can get rid of a lot of these uh, a lot of these variables as well so we don't need to have the a tags and the collection or indeed the input so let's get rid of all that as well so that's a much much simpler way to get a reference to a particular html document if i just execute this just to prove that it does indeed work we end up on a page with all the exchange rates tables for gpp gbp sorry with an amount of three much much simpler Now, of course, not every website is constructed in the same way. Not every website uses query strings. So if you try to do the same thing with a YSL website and pass in a query string using Excel VBA as a search phrase, that simply wouldn't work. So there are reasons why you might need to use Internet Explorer. But if you can navigate to a web page and you can get to a page that exactly the page you want using query strings then there's actually no reason to use Internet Explorer at all. There's a much more efficient way that avoids the complexity and the, the overhead involved in running a separate application and waiting for it to browse to a page. So what we're going to do is have a look at using another object library which allows us to connect to a web page, retrieve a set of results without having to open up a separate application at all. Now I'm actually going to use the exact same subroutine that I've just created here. I'm going to copy and paste it into the same module this time, I think, just to avoid creating lots and lots of different modules. And let me just close down the immediate window for the time being as well. Now I need to modify the uh, the subroutine name. I can't have two subroutines with the same name in the same scope. So let's call this with query string and XML. So that gives you a clue about to about what we're about to do. We're going to reference another object library. If you head back to the Tools menu and choose References, and then if you scroll down far enough, you're going to find a list of references called Microsoft XML, and you should find there's a variety of these available. Some slightly more old-fashioned, slightly more sort of out-of-date ones, and the most modern one that I've got access to is version 6. So technically, you should go with the most recent version that's on your machine, unless you're supporting legacy applications. In this case, I'm going to check the one for version 6, and then click OK. So this XML library lets us get a set of results from a web page without having to go via a web browser. So what that means is I can get rid of my variable which refers to Internet Explorer and I can replace it with a completely new variable. What should we call this? Let's call this one, let's call it, um, let's call it XML page, I guess. I can't think of a much better name for it than that. And the type of object that we're going to store in there is an msxml2, that's the name of the library we've just referenced, and specifically an XML 
HTTP, and in this case it's 60, 606.0, so that refers to the particular version of XML that I'm using. Now if you'd referenced a previous version of the object library, you might find that you don't have access, of course, to the 6.0 version, in which case it might just be XML HTTP, or it might be XML HTTP 50, so it might be slightly different depending on which library you referenced. In my case it's definitely 60, and if you wanted to check yourself which one you were using, then the best thing to do is head to the View menu and choose Object Browser, and then look for the msxml2 library. If you scroll down far enough to the uh, the class that starts with msxml http, you ought to find somewhere in there. Sorry, there we go. XML http 60 in my case. So you might find that's got a slightly different name in your own particular version. I'm just going to close down the object browser and then look at what are the changes we need to make to this code to get that page. What I'm going to do next is convert both of these variables into auto-instancing variables. So to avoid having to create new instances explicitly, I'm going to rely on those to do that for me themselves. So add the new keyword to each of the variable declarations. Now of course because we're not opening Internet Explorer, there's absolutely no reason to try to make Internet Explorer visible, so let's get rid of that instruction. And then the URL part, the way the, the the part that this comes into play is when we try to open up this XML HTTP 60 connection. So rather than ie.navigate, what we're going to do is say XML page dot open. Now there are several parameters to fill in here. The URL is actually the second parameter. So before we do that, we've got to say what method we're trying to apply to this. The particular method to get a set of results is simply called get, but you have to enter that as a string. So in a set of double quotes, enter the word get followed by a comma, then you pass in the URL, which we've already got there. And then one last thing that is worthwhile doing, there's a third, it's an optional parameter, var async. So this is the asynchronous property of, uh, of this connection. If we set this to false, what that will do is run the connection synchronously, which means that essentially everything else will wait until the page is loaded. It's almost the equivalent of waiting for Internet Explorer's ready state, which in this case, of course, we don't need to do. So we can get rid of that loop as well. Um, what we then need to do is we need to send that request to uh, to the XML page. So we're going to say XML page dot send. So that sends the request we've just built, and then we need to wait for the response. Now, when we get the response, what we want to do is set all of the um, the HTML of our HTML document to be equal to the response text from that XML request. So we're going to say HTML doc dot body dot inner HTML equals. So what this will do is create a brand new HTML document. So remember we're, we're using an auto instancing variable at this point, but not we don't have an HTML document already. So this will create a brand new one and set its inner HTML property of its body equal to our XML page dot response text. So Having done that, we've basically now got to the same point we were at with the uh, with the Excel Internet oh, sorry with the um, Internet Explorer example. Now, one important difference of this technique over Internet Explorer is that although Internet Explorer has some validation in place to make sure that the URL is always perfectly formed. With this technique, that's not always the case. If I try to execute this right now, I'm going to end up with a runtime error. I hit debug, it's going to fail on trying to open up that URL. Let's just stop that one. So the simple way to solve that problem is just to make sure that your URL is properly formed. So if I say HTTP forward slash, big pardon, colon forward slash, and then execute it again, although we won't see any results, of course, at least we don't get any runtime errors. Now, just to make sure that we are getting essentially the same results from this, I want to do a quick little test that gives us a list of tables, so at least counts how many tables there are in the page we navigate to. So if I just use the Internet Explorer version just for the moment, and then just show you what, what I'm after in this case, there are a couple of different tables in this page. So if I just right-click on one of them and choose Inspect Element, I ought to find somewhere in there when the DOM Explorer starts, finally finishes loading, I ought to find that in somewhere in there. We've got a table tag. So I want to look at all the table tags in the page. Let me just close that down. And then what I'm going to do to make that work is declare a couple of basic variables. So let's say dim HTML tables as mshtml dot ihtml element collection. So just as we've done previously. 
And then what I'd like to do is once I've got to the page and I've uh, set a reference to it, I'm going to say set HTML tables equals HTML doc dot get elements by tag name. And then in this case, the tag name, excuse me, the tag name is table. Having done that, all I'd like to do is debug.print HTML tables dot length, just as we've done before. And the nice thing is that I can just copy and paste exactly the same code into my other routines. Let me just do that quickly before we give it a quick test. So copy the variable declaration and then the two lines which set a reference and print out the length. At that point, I'm just going to open up the immediate window. So I press Control and G and then Control A to select it all and then delete just to get rid of it all. Okay, so if I execute the one which involves using Internet Explorer, just to see the results, we'll wait for the page to load, and then wait for all the adverts to load, and then eventually the page will stop uh, loading and print out the number two, so two tables altogether. Let me just close down Internet Explorer and just prove that if I run the second one, we won't see Internet Explorer pop up, of course, but if I run it, I'll get the number two. But hopefully you can tell that runs an awful lot quicker than the Internet Explorer version. So if all you're interested in is the actual values of the page, the, the, the actual HTML of the page you're trying to retrieve, then don't go via Internet Explorer. This technique is much, much quicker. So bearing that in mind, we're going to move on a little bit now and look at what we can do with the, res the response text, the, uh, the HTML that's returned. From this point forwards, it doesn't really matter which technique you're using, whether you're using Internet Explorer or the XML technique. What we're going to do with the HTML will work regardless. OK, so the next thing we're going to do is write a subroutine which processes all of the tables on the page that we've referenced. Because I'd like to be able to test this using both of the different techniques we've used so far, both with Internet Explorer and XML HTTP requests, we're going to write a separate subroutine which accepts a, an HTML document as a single parameter. So we're just going to tidy up the two procedures we've written here so far. I'm going to get rid of the variables that refers to the HTML tables, and then we're going to get rid of the two lines which set and then debug some information about that collection. We'll do that in both of the procedures. Then what I'm going to do is head over to another new module, just to keep all the code separate again. So I'm going to insert one new module, and in there I'm going to create a new subroutine. So this one's going to be called a Process HTML Page, and we're going to have a single parameter in here called HTML Page as an mshtml.html document. OK, so that procedure will accept a single parameter, and we can call that one now from each of the two procedures that we've just finished writing. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is process all of the tables on the document that we passed into this subroutine. And we'll use the exact same technique we've used to process all the hyperlinks and all the buttons in the previous examples. So let's start by declaring a variable which I'm going to call HTML table as an mshtml.ihtml element. Then we'll need the corresponding variable which will hold the collection, so in this case dim HTML tables as mshtml.ihtml element collection. I'll just scroll through the list, you're going to get so bored of writing this if you're doing this a lot in the real world. Okay, so the next job is to get a reference to the tables collection. And the way we're going to do that is by saying set HTML tables equals HTML page dot get elements by tag name. So just as we've done previously, we're going to get elements by tag name and we're going to refer to the table tag. OK, so now we can loop over those tables using a simple for each loop. So we can say for each HTML table in HTML tables. So if I use the IntelliSense just to help me out with that, to save me a bit of typing. And of course we need to say next HTML table. And inside there, all we're going to do is print out some information about each table. So we're going to use a simple debug.print statement. We will actually get around to writing out some useful information into some worksheets shortly. But for now, I just want to debug.print HTML table dot class name. So I'm going to look for the, uh, for the, uh, sorry, for an HTML table dot class name. I'm going for HTML page there. HTML table dot class name. So having done that, I'm just going to go back to module number four and make a call to this process HTML page. So I'm going to go to module number four, and in each one of these, um, in each one of these subroutines, so using Internet Explorer and the XML example, I'm going to say process 
HTML page, and into that I'm going to pass in this HTML doc variable. So HTML doc for each one of these. I'll just copy and paste exactly the same code into the other procedure as well. OK, I'm going to run this one first using Internet Explorer, just because I'd like to be able to leave the web page open so we can see what we're doing. So I just click back into the Internet Explorer example and run that one using the F5 key, and we'll end up with that website displayed, and it's printed out two names for the two tables involved in that page. Just to prove that the same thing will work whether we do it with the XML version, so I can just click into that procedure and run that one as well, and I'll get the exact same two class names. But the beauty of that is that I didn't have to wait for Internet Explorer to fire up, and of course load the web page, wait for all those stupid adverts to load, etc, etc. So, having done that, the next job is to start looking into these tables and work out what elements we can extract from them. So back to inspecting elements in our web page, let me just right click somewhere inside this table and choose Inspect Element. Now this is probably going to turn up quite a lot of code, so I've looks like I've right clicked on one of the header cells, the one that has the word British Pounds in it. So you can see that I've got a, uh, an item here, and a tag called TH, which is, refers to table header, so that refers to a single cell in the table header row. That's enclosed within a TR tag, which represents a table row. And that's enclosed within the tHead tag, which of course um, corresponds to the table header. All of that's contained within the rates table table, so you can see that clearly corresponds to what we've printed out here already. Now there's also a table body tag. If I expand the table body, that corresponds to all the individual rows in that table, and each one of those is represented by another by another TR tag. So inside there we've got individual TD tags, so in a standard table row, rather than in a header where they're called TH tags, in a standard row they're called TD tags. But again, you can hopefully see that for each TD tag, it corresponds to what information is shown in that cell. So what, we're, what I'd like to do now is write some code that will loop over all of the various elements of each table and write this data out into a new Excel worksheet. So I'm just going to leave this, um, this Internet Explorer instance open for the moment, just so we can refer back to this if, if required. Let's head back to the VB editor and head back into module number 5 to work out what extra code we need to write. To loop through the table rows, we can use pretty much exactly the same technique we've just used to loop through the tables themselves. So we can get the elements by tag name, looking for TR tags, and then loop through all of the individual HTML elements in that collection. So let's just have another variable which we'll use to hold a reference to a single row. So I'm going to say dim HTML row as an mshtml dot i HTML element. So just copied and pasted that, and then inside our original for each loop, we'll write another one. So we can say for each HTML row in HTML table, and then what we're going to do is apply the get elements by tag name method directly to this HTML table element. Now, confusingly, the IntelliSense doesn't show us that that's possible. Sadly, it shows us that we can get an attribute but not get elements by tag name. But we can still each each node in a in an HTML document contains child nodes, and you can pretty much apply the same techniques to the main document as you can to each individual node. Certainly, in this case, we're getting elements by tag name. So, although the IntelliSense doesn't doesn't clue us in on the fact that we can do this, we can happily get elements by tag name. And in fact, what I'm going to do is just copy and paste from the previous example. I'm going to say get elements by tag name, and then simply change that so it says tr. So I can close off the loop then by saying next HTML row, and what I'm going to do then is debug.print, let's say a tab character, so let's say debug.print a VB tab, as well as the inner text of that row. So I'm going to say HTML row dot inner text. So having done that, let's just give this one another quick test. I'm going to clear out the contents of the immediate window first, head back to module number four, and then I'm going to run my XML version just to make it quicker. So hopefully we can see there that we have indeed printed out each individual row. So we've got um, two tables, rates table first, and then indented one, one tab space. We've got each individual row of that table. Then it moves on to the next table, and does exactly the same thing for that table as well. 
Now the next job is to start separating each row into its individual cells. So let's head back to module number 5 and as you can probably imagine we're going to use pretty much exactly the same technique again, another for each loop to loop through all of the elements in each row. So let's start by declaring another variable which I'm going to say dim html cell as another ms html i html element. I'm getting bored of saying it, never mind typing it, so let's just copy and paste from that line. So let's have another quick go. If we go back into our loop that loops over the rows, we can have another for each loop. So I'm going to say for each html cell in. Now we can use exactly the same technique as we've just looked at to return the rows in each table. I can refer to HTML row, which is another element, and then I can apply the get elements by tag name. So I'm going to say get elements by tag name, even though the IntelliSense doesn't show me that I can do that. And in fact, to avoid mistyping it, let me just copy and paste. And then we just need to update the tag that we're testing for. In this case, I'm going to go for the T D tag, which is going to cause us a small issue, as you'll see shortly. But for each HTML cell in um, in the in the uh, the rows cells, and we need to say next HTML cell. I'm just going to once again debug dot print. Let's say a VB tab, and the HTML cell dot inner text. Okay, so I'm just going to take away this debug.print statement to avoid printing out the same information more than once. And then let's just go back to module number four and give that one a quick test. So if I run the XML version again, just to make sure it runs as quickly as possible, ooh, I should clear out the contents of the immediate window again. And then I can run this uh, XML version one more time. And we'll see this time we get each piece of information separated out by cell. So not just an entire row printed out, each individual cell's value printed out. Now there is one small problem with what we've done in this example. Because we looked for explicitly TD tags, what we're missing from this list is any reference to the table header cells. If I can browse it far enough, hopefully you can see here the table sorter rates table. We start with the first row of data, the first TD cell, which is Argentine peso. So if I quickly look back at the currency table, and if I scroll down to that one, you can see that's exactly what we've got. So we've missed out the header rows, and I quite like to include those. Now it is possible to loop through the, or, or we could use the get elements by tag name and look for the th tags, um, but that's going to be a little bit inconvenient. It means we've got to do two separate loops, one to loop over the th tags and then another one to loop over the td tags. So what we're going to do instead is just modify which collection we're looping over. Back in module number five, rather than printing out or looping through all of the elements whose tag is TD, what we're going to do instead is simply loop over all of the children of the table row. So this is a completely different collection here. You can see there's a children property of an HTML element. So thinking about this idea that HTML documents are made up of a series of nested uh, tags, then you can imagine that any child of the row will be any tag that sits directly inside it. So if we just look back at the DOM Explorer, you can see that for a table row, we've got, in this case, in the header row, the children are th tags. And then for the data rows, you can see that the children of the tr are the td tags instead. So this means that we can avoid this little problem of having to loop over separately the th tags and the td tags. So simply having made that change, if I switch back to the code and then go back into module number four again, and again I'm going to clear the contents of the immediate window and then just run the XML version one more time. And this time, if I scroll up again far enough, what I ought to see, I don't think I've got quite enough space to print out everything in the immediate window. It does have a limit, but hopefully here you can see, look, I've got table sort of rates table and it's printing out the header row. So British pound, three GBP and one GBP. So that corresponds to the, the header row shown here. So that's kind of a nice convenient little uh, technique to use to print out or loop through the children of any element in an HTML document. Okay, so all that remains now is to take the information from the immediate window and start writing it out into worksheet cells. So here's what I'd like to achieve back in module number five. For each table that we loop over, I'd like to create a completely separate worksheet for each one. And then on each 
worksheet, I'd like to print out, first of all, a quick little header, which includes the class name of the table and the date timestamp, and then the header row from the table, and then every single row of data from that table. So let's just clear out the immediate window. In fact, I'm just going to close the immediate window down for the time being, because we've got all the, the loops that do the hard work here. All that we really need to do now is work out how to get that printed into the correct elements in the worksheets. So to start with, what we'll need to do is, for each table that we loop over, we'll need to create a new worksheet. That's relatively straightforward. We've done this in many videos in the past. I'm going to say worksheets.add. There's lots of ways you can control exactly where the worksheet appears. As we've talked about in previous videos, you've got a before and an after parameter, which you can use to specify exactly where the worksheet appears. I'm just going to accept that the sheet appears wherever it wants to, basically, to the left of whichever sheet is currently active when the code runs. Then what I'm going to do is, rather than debug.print HTML table.classname, I'm going to set range A1's value equal to HTML tables.classname. So when you add a new worksheet, that sheet becomes the active sheet. So you can refer to range A1 on that sheet and it will, uh, will allow us to set its value. I'd also like to say range B1.value equals now, so that will give us a date and time stamp showing us exactly when the data was printed. That's kind of an important thing because unlike in the previous video, when we were using query tables that can refresh and bring in the most recent data, the technique we're using here prints a, a fixed set of values. So it's great for getting historical data and maintaining that historical data. Not so great if you want the live refresh like we had in the previous video. Now what we need to do is work out which cell in the worksheet the data from the table will go into. So let's declare a couple of extra variables just to help out with that. I'm going to have dim row num as long, comma col num as integer. Then what I'm going to do is once I've created a new worksheet and I've printed out some data into row number one, so cell A1 and B1, I'm going to set the row num parameter, or sorry, the row num variable to be equal to the number two. I need to do a similar thing before I start looping over each of the cells in the row. So before I begin that for each loop, I'm going to say col num equals 1. So that's, that assumes I'm going to start putting my data into column A in the worksheet. And then what I'm going to do is rather than debug.print the information from the cell, I'm going to use the cells property of the worksheet. So I'm going to say cells, open some parentheses, and then I'm going to say row num so I'm passing in the, the, the index number of the row that I want to set the value of, and then a comma, and then the column num will of course be the col num variable. So cells row num col num equals HTML cell dot inner text. What I've then got to do is before I move on to the next cell in the row, I want to increase the column number. So to do that, I can say col num equals col num plus one. Sorry, let me get spell that correctly. Col num plus one. Finally, just before we move on to the next row, I want to do a similar thing to increase the row count. So I can say, just before I move on to the next row, I want to say row num equals row num plus one. Okay, so apart from a little bit of formatting and tidying up, that's pretty much the core part of the code written. Let's head back into module number four, and let's give this one a quick test using the, the XML version, the quick version. So I just run this one now, we ought to see a couple of new worksheets appear, and if I switch back into Excel, I ought to find that I've got one sheet containing the data for all the currencies. I'll just widen the columns a little bit. I could have written code to do this, of course, and, and formatted the headers. If I switch back onto sheet two, we've got the data from the top 10 rates table. So there we go. So all that's working quite kind of nicely. If we wanted to do a bit of tidying up and sort of getting these columns to to be the correct width, etc., and formatting, all that's relatively trivial stuff, and we've covered that in a lot of previous videos. So I, I don't want to go into all that sort of basic formatting stuff again at this stage. What I am interested in doing, however, is making our code a little bit more flexible and dynamic, similar to the technique we used in the previous video, where we were able to modify the query string that we were using. So rather than always getting this exact currency in this exact amount, making that part variable using some basic user inputs. Now there are lots of different techniques I could use to get some user input, which will set the currency and the amount. So I could just use simple input boxes, which I've used in many of the previous videos in the series, asking the user for a currency and then an amount. 
that's a little bit flaky. It's the least easy to control what the user does, particularly for a list of currencies which should be a fixed list. They shouldn't just be allowed to type in whatever they want. We could do as we did in the previous video, whereby we set up some cells on the worksheet. So we re reserved a couple of cells and used some basic data validation techniques to create a drop-down list of currencies, and then validated another cell which would only accept numbers that weren't negative. Those techniques worked, and we've seen that already in the previous video. Hopefully you watched that one. Another technique, and probably the, the best technique in the long run, would be to create some kind of user form. Th that would be the easiest one to control, and the easiest one to validate as well. What we'll do just to start with, though, is set up a version of this procedure that we can call and then pass into it the currency and the amount we want. So I'm just going to create a new copy of this XML version of the subroutine, which connects to the XRates website. I beg your pardon, I just hit the wrong shortcut key there. So Control C to copy, and then I can insert another new module into which I'm going to paste this procedure. I will change its name as well, so I'm just going to call it Get Exchange Rates and then take away the with query string and XML part. And then I'm going to declare a couple of simple parameters. So the first one is going to be called um, from currency as a string, followed by another comma, and then I'm going to say amount as, let's say, what should we have this one as? This one can be a double. OK, so having declared those two, what we'll then do is modify the URL to be built up of all the different parts we've passed in. So to help with that, I'm going to declare a new variable, which I'm going to simply call URL as a string. And then I'm going to say URL equals, and then start building up the string out of the various component parts. So the first part will be equal to this first part of our URL. Let me just copy that part and place it into a set of double quotes. Then from that, I would like to concatenate the value of the from currency parameter. So I can say from currency. And then from that, I would like to concatenate another string of text, so that's picking up from this part here, so ampersand amount equals, and then I can paste that into the double quotes, and then finally concatenate onto the end of that the value of the amount parameter. So all I need to do then at that point is modify the, the open method, so I'm not referring to that fixed string, I'm referring to whatever string I've built up in this URL variable. So from there, all I need to do is create some way to call this procedure passing in a currency and an amount. The longest window way to do this would be using a user form. Now I've got a whole series of videos about creating user forms, so just to run through the absolute basics of how that works, let's right click in the project and choose insert user form, and on there what I'd like to do is generate a combo box, which is the fancy name for a drop-down list, and then also a simple text box into which I can type an amount. So I can just use, do that using the toolbox. Again, I'm not going to go into any real detail here about creating user forms. There's an entire series all about this. So I'm kind of assuming you know at least a little bit about forms at this point. Um, I'm going to give these objects sensible names. So rather than this just being called combo box one, I'm just going to modify its name slightly. So I'm going to call it, um, what am I going to call it? I'm going to call it currency. And then, oh, I can't call it that because it's a data type called currency, of course. So let's call it um, from currency. I'll get that correct. There we go. And then the text box that I'm going to put in there is simply going to be called amount. Okay, then what I'll need is a button that I can click on to run the code. So I'm going to go back to the toolbox and find a command button and draw one of those somewhere. And I'm going to call this command button something like get rates. I can change its caption there as well, so it says something more useful rather than command button one. It can be, you can say, get rates, and then I could also change the caption of the form itself. So I can change its name first of all. So I've got an easy way to to reference it. So I can call it rates form or rates form. There we go, and I can change its caption there as well, so that it says something like uh, choose rates. You can see that changing in the title bar up at the top of the form. Now I need, of course, a sensible way to launch this form as well. So what I'll do then is head back into module number six, and I'm going to create a simple little subroutine that's going to be called Open Rates Form. And then what I'm going to do is have a simple line of code that says Rates Form dot show. So that'll make it appear on screen. Now what I can do is somewhere in my workbook, so 
getting very long-winded this process. I said it was quite. I said it was the longest window, most tedious way to do it. I'm going to pick sheet one as my basic user interface. Head onto the develop, developer tab in the ribbon. Head into the insert tool and draw a basic form controls button. So if I draw one of those on the web. Oh, sorry, on the uh, on the worksheet, I can choose the open rates form macro, as it's called, or subroutine. Click OK, and then I'll just change the uh, the size of the button a little bit. Edit the text on there so that it says something like "get rates." Okay, so at that point, if I just click away from the button, and I'll just zoom in a little bit on the on the screen, and then click the get rates button, it will open up the form. So the couple of extra things I've got to do now, I've got to populate this drop down list with some sensible values and then a bit of validation as well for the text box to make sure that I type in a number and not a negative number Then hook all of that up to the click event of the get rates button to run all the code. So I'm just going to close the form down at that point, head back to the VB editor and then let's go back to the design of the form which I'm already there. Let's deal with populating this drop down list first of all. There are quite a few different ways to do that. One simple way is to add items to the combo box when the form is first loaded. So a quick simple way to get to the events of the form is just to double click on its background. If I do that, I'll be taken to the code view of the form. I've got slightly the wrong event, I've got the click event. When the event that I really want, if I use the drop down list at the top right hand corner, is the initialize event. So if I select initialize, that will generate the correct event handler. I can then just get rid of the click event. Writing code to populate the combo box is pretty straightforward. All I need to do is refer to the from currency drop down list and then say dot add item. Then all I've got to do in there is specify exactly what item I want to add in. So let's say let's put GBP in there first. Everything else is essentially just a repeat of that. So however many currencies I want to get, as long as I know what their names are from the website, I can add them to the list. So in fact, if, we, if we're going to add a few, let's have a simple with a block here. So I'm going to say with from currency and then say dot add item. I'll drop in the end with and then I can simply copy and paste this a few times. So let's, sorry, that keyboard shortcut's not quite working again. There we go. Copy and paste and then we can change the currency. Let's have USD and we can say, uh, what else can we have? We can have EUR for euros. We could have uh, JPY as well. It's kind of important here, of course, to match the text with the actual acceptable values from the website. So at this point, you'll probably want to have a quick check. You can see all the little abbreviations which are relevant here. So let's have uh, Australian dollars and Canadian dollars as well, shall we say. So we can add in a couple more. So that's AUD and another one which is CAD. Okay, so that will populate the drop-down list. The next thing we've got to do is make sure that when we double-click, sorry, when we click on the button, it does a little bit of validation to make sure we've entered a number into the amount box. So let's head back into the design view of the form. We can do that by just double-clicking. And then if we double-click on the button, that'll take us to the correct event handler or the default event handler for the click event of that button. Now the validation code we're going to add here is very similar to the stuff we did in the example from the previous video. So what I'm going to do in here is write a simple if statement that will say if not is numeric, then I'm going to look for the amount object, so that's the text box I renamed earlier on, um, amount.value, then we'll have a quick little bit of validation code. We could display a simple message box, message box, uh, the amount must be a number, excuse me, amount must be a number. And then we should also check, um, sorry, Beckman, I want to make sure that I exit the subroutine at that point. We should also check, I suppose, that we have entered a positive number as well. We wouldn't want to enter negative numbers in there. So we could also just do a quick simple thing that says if, uh, let's say, amount.value is less than or equal to zero, then we could say, um, pop up with another message box which says the amount must be positive. You can add the insult of your choice at the end of that just in case you've got some users who insist on doing the wrong thing all the time and then we say exit sub and then end if again. We should also just check that we have actually selected an amount from the combo box as well so we could add another if statement up here we could say if, beg pardon sorry, we could say if uh, from currency dot value equals an empty string then again another simple message box uh, you must pick a currency and then we could exit sub 
and then end if. Now, annoyingly with combo boxes, or maybe this is actually a good fit, good feature with combo boxes on user forms, by default they're not restricted to the items you've populated the list with, so I could legitimately type in anything else in the drop-down list that I like. If you wanted to fix that, the simplest thing to do is go back to the design view of the form, select the combo box, and then look for the match required property. So I scroll down the list and look for the match required property, you'll see it's currently set to false. If I change that to true, I can then ensure that I only pick a value from that drop-down list. So I just want to quickly check that, that system works so far. If I go back to the workbook, click Get Rates, and then make sure if I click Get Rates first of all, it says I must, the amount must be a number, so I haven't typed anything in yet, so let's make sure I type in a number. Let's try typing in a negative number. Uh, it's going to be a positive number, okay, fine. So let's put in, I don't know, three. Then let's click Get Rates. It says I must pick a currency. So of course I haven't done that. I can't just type in whatever I want. If I try to do that, it says that's invalid. I must pick one from the list. So I got GBP3, click Get Rates, and nothing will happen yet, of course, but that just ensures that the validation part works. OK, let's close the form down, head back to the VB editor, and we'll just hook up the last tiny little bit of code in the Get Rates Click event. And the great thing for us now is that all we have to do at this point is call our get exchange rates procedure. So I can say get exchange rates, and then I've got to pass in two values. So the first value has got to be the currency that I've selected from the drop-down list. So I can say um, what did I call the drop-down list? It was from currency, wasn't it? So from currency dot value, followed by a comma, and then all I've got to do then is pass in the amount as well, and that's coming from the amount text box. That's amount dot value. Okay, so having just done that, let's just head back into Excel and we'll give it a final quick little test. So I'm going to choose Get Rates. I'm going to go for, let's go for Euros this time, and I'm going to go for a value of 2. Then click Get Rates, and we ought to see that in the background we end up with tables for the Euros, or 2 Euros. If I just close the form down so I can look at that data, I get the same table names, timestamps, euros, two. I've got another sheet there that's got the basic top 10 table as well. Phew, so it's a little bit of effort to, to work with. And of course, we haven't done all the formatting stuff yet either, which I'm not going to do in this particular video. Um, I'm sure you can work out actually the formatting from various other things we've done. That's kind of the trivial part. The important thing is we've got a really nice, useful system now that queries a web page in the most efficient way possible without opening up Internet Explorer. Of course, I've left that one open from earlier on. Um, and gets your table of data, pasted into some worksheet cells by looping over the various elements in the web, the web page. So, well, it's been quite a long video. I hope you've got some use out of some of those features and hope you can adapt that to your own needs. Hope you found it useful. Thanks for watching. See you next time. If you like what you've seen here, why not head over to the YSL website where you can find loads more free resources, including these videos, some written blogs and tutorials, and even some exercises that you can download to practice your skills. Thanks for watching. See you next time.